model that apparently, according to my definition up here, and actually let me do this a little further, let me delete these for the moment, it doesn't exist, right? This class has been so whittled down that there's no mention of name publicly or privately. There's definitely no method called name. All there is is this magical method. So what PHP will do is that when you do access a field like s arrow name, if it doesn't exist, it will call for you this magical method, which if you have implemented, you can then exercise control over exactly what's returned. So in this case here, I could do something like, well, ideally I just want to return something like uh, this name, but the, uh, what I can actually do in something like this is I can say private properties, and I can declare this as, for instance, an array. And then what I can do is this properties, quote unquote, name. I can essentially have a secret storage container that stores all of these fields, if only to eliminate a lot of the boilerplate code that I would have had to write again and again and again and again for all of these getters, which are almost all identical if all they do is return this arrow something. So this is perhaps an elegant solution to that problem of code duplication, but the setters can be implemented similarly. And if you do implement them in this way, you would do public function underscore underscore set name and a value. And I know that it takes those two arguments just by just from the documentation. And in here, I would ha then have to decide based on the name how and where to set that field. And so realize this is one approach that's available to you. So frankly, this is one of the sexier features of PHP that allows you to lessen the amount of code that you have to write while still providing some fairly basic functionality. And there's a bunch of others in addition to those. Yeah, Carl. Instead of that, just have uh, $s uh, arrow name equals. Exactly. So what's nice about PHP is that if it realizes that you are do writing code like this, s arrow name gets something, the mere fact that you have the arrow on the left and the assignment operator on the right, it's going to invoke for you underscore underscore set magically, as they say. So there's one thing worth noting here is that we're using this setter, and yet I have an opportunity right from the start to initialize this student object. In fact, that might be much more appropriate if you never really want empty uh, dataless student objects to exist in memory. You don't want to use setters per se. How else can you pass in values or default values to objects? Yeah, like so. Yeah, so you have constructors, right? And so in PHP, unfortunately, you can only explicitly define one constructor function, uh, one constructor method, um, because in PHP you can't override methods' names by having a foo method that takes one argument and then a a another foo method that takes two arguments, which you can do in other languages like Java. Um, and the like, um, you can achieve that same functionality, but not as cleanly. So for now, let's just assume that I'm going to implement public function underscore underscore construct, and I can specify values to take. I can do something like name, and I can take year, and then here, let's skip data validation for the moment. Let's just do this name gets name, and this year gets year, and let's roll back to the original version, whereby, you know what, I'm just going to explicitly say we have a private name and a private year. So here's my construct, and what's good about this model now, whereby I can call the constructor as follows. Instead of new student, I can instead say David, comma, 1999, close, paren, or something like that. What's advantageous now about introducing this third magical method? Magical only in as much as it starts with underscore, underscore. Here, yeah. Perfect. So in this way, it's a little more efficient in that you don't have to, one, instantiate the object, two, go ahead and set the actual properties. And also, as I suggested earlier, it also, if we now eliminate the setter method, which we've already, if we eliminate the setter method here, now there's no way for a dataless student object to exist because when you instantiate this student object now, you have to provide those values. And in fact, the interpreter will yell at you if you try to just instantiate a student object without passing in any arguments or the wrong number of arguments. So that's a plus. Um, what else does this allow us to do? Well, similarly, could you put some kind of data validation here? Although the downside here is that it's typically not good practice for constructors to throw exceptions or the like. Um, and so there's some less obvious ways of handling errors, potentially. Um, but also, how does this approach to constructors maybe not scale? Right? We're also kind of we're skimping on what a student is for the sake of discussion. But what's the logical extension of this approach? Yeah? You might have constructor with 20 arguments. 
Right. It's going to get a little atrocious once we give students、uh, like、email addresses and phone numbers and dorms and home addresses and all of this. And my God, then you have to be mindful of the order. And so, in terms of backwards compatibility and agreeing with your partner or some company as to what your API is, you can't tomorrow change the order of name and year just because you decide a little anally that you prefer it the other way. Because their code, of course, is now going to break. Any method call that said foo comma bar, they're going to have to change to bar comma foo. And similarly, if you keep adding It、and adding and adding to this comma-separated list, you can at least be backwards compatible like this. You can say, you know what, we're going to support an email address, but just in case you're using the old version of the API, we're going to give it a default value of false. So PHP does have this ability to assign default values, so that you can still call this constructor with two arguments, or if you want three. So that helps mitigate backwards compatibility. But again, if we get up to 20、uh, properties, this is just going to be a pain. So what's a solution to that problem, perhaps? Where you want to pass in a large or arbitrary number of arguments, but you don't want to hard code it in advance. Yeah. So a very common paradigm in Perl and in PHP and in JavaScript, especially, is you know what? Let's not even commit to some order because I'm never going to be happy with the right order, and then we're going to run into issues with which should be,、uh, uh, which are required, which are optional fields, what should the order be. So you know what? I could actually say something like this: properties gets array, so that by default, this. Argument is just an empty array, and that's fine if we do want to allow dataless student objects to exist. And actually, if we don't want that, we can instead say, you know what, this has to be an array, but it's not going to have a default value. You've got to pass me in something. And for those unfamiliar, PHP 5.3. Um, which has started to come into vogue, actually does provide a bit of data type hinting. So PHP is still loosely typed, whereby you don't have to specify int and char and float and the like. But they're starting to provide us with features like this, where you can tell the interpreter, "This is I don't know what it's an array of, but it is an array." And by telling the interpreter array space and then variable name, it will ensure that only an array is passed in. And you can do this with objects as well, but not primitives, not int, char, float, and the like. All right. So, how do you then access these fields? Well, then you would simply do something like, well, properties, quote unquote, and then properties, quote unquote, year. Voila. So, in short, a whole number of directions you can go. And, and frankly, the very first approach of just having public data fields not horrible if you just need it for a simple container. But as soon as your code gets more sophisticated, as soon as you have to start making an API commitment to someone else, you better start thinking about these kinds of design decisions so you don't regret them later. So, any questions on OOP constructors, setters, getters? Because the syntax is about to change. <laughs> Anything at all? Everyone knows what OOP is now. Okay, no Objective C for you. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so let's let's dive in. So this is Objective C, and what looks familiar, right? Especially for those of you who haven't seen C for two or three years, what's what's familiar? What are you going to cling to now? What's argv? Yes, we've seen argv and argc. Those are back. What else? Yeah. Yeah, so something that looks like a header file. We have a slash, which we typically didn't see in something like CS50, but it does in fact exist all throughout the Linux source code and、uh, large-scale C programs.、Um, it's not include though; it's import, which actually has different meaning.、Um, but we'll get to that. It's actually just a better version of include.、Um, seems like we have pointers. Yay. Um, seems like we have arrays, as in, suggested by the square brackets. There, there's this funky notation of the at sign and something called an auto release pool. This was actually something that was only introduced into Objective C by Apple、uh, this past summer.、Uh, for the course, we will be using not only iOS 5, which is the latest version of the、uh, software that you might have on your own personal iOS devices, but version 4.2 or 4, or rather 4.3 of the SDK, ideally on Lion. But if you still have Snow Leopard. On your own computer, it's doable.、Um, just read the FAQs on the course's website as to what your options are. And if you have a PC, know that we've made available a dedicated computer lab in the Science Center that's usually used by the sciences, but we can use it any time they're not holding classes or like there. Details on that are also in the FAQs.、Um, so just refer to that if need be.、Um, 
All right, and return zero. That looks pretty familiar. So it turns out that even though we're going to be using Xcode, which is Apple's own IDE, integrated development environment, sort of Apple's version of Eclipse or NetBeans or the like,、um, you can write Objective C、um, certainly at a command line using Notepad or Vim or Emacs or the like. It's really a language not all that dissimilar from C, but as soon as you want to start doing iPhone or iPad programming, well, then there's just so much in the way of libraries that Apple provides that it's just a pain to configure it all yourself at the command line. Line、or to configure a make file、uh, for yourself. And so this is why, certainly in this world, people tend to use the IDE. But for the simple case of discussion, We can actually use it at the command line. And the compiler that Xcode now uses is something called Clang.、Um, this is, in many ways, a better version of GCC. It actually supports many of the same command line switches that you might have used in 50 or 61.、Um, but its error messages, among other things, are typically a little more clear.、Uh, you might think, recall fondly GCC's fairly arcane error messages. Clangs are still somewhat arcane, but there's at least more detail. And so one of the nice features about Xcode is that it leverages this Clang compiler. To provide you with pretty good suggestions and yellow triangles and red X's when something's wrong with your code by pre processing it and figuring out where you might have erred. So you'll actually find, I hope, that Xcode's actually a pretty good development environment.、Um, and in fact, it uses,、um, for those who haven't taken something like CS 153 compilers at the college,、um, this is、uh, Clang's what's generally known as a front end to a compiler. LLVM is the back end that Apple uses. And essentially, this means that Clang compiles. Your code, your Objective C, into some in intermediate representation, and then the back end compiler takes over from there and takes it down to zeros and ones.、Um, so realize that Clang and LLVM are the ones that you'll use by default, but GCC was used for many years by Apple and the like for Xcode. So you may see mentions of that on the internet. All right, so let's go ahead and write a very simple、uh, Objective C program like this one here. So let me go ahead. And open up not in the appliance. Let's turn this off now and largely for the rest of the term after project one. And let's go into a terminal window on my own Mac. And notice that I do have Clang installed because I installed Xcode on my computer. I also have GCC, which comes with Xcode as well.、Um, but for now, we'll just use Clang. And let me go ahead and create something like hello.m.、Um, typically, in the world of Objective C, instead of having .h and .c files, you have .h and .m. Files, .m generally denoting methods. Your methods go in there and your header declarations go somewhere else.、Uh, let me go ahead and、uh, go ahead do whoops, import foundation slash foundation.h. Let me go ahead and do int main int argc const char star argv.、Um, you'll see. And this is one disclaimer about Xcode. Many different people seem to contribute code to the Xcode IDE. So you will see stylistic differences throughout their various templates, which I find personally annoying.、Um, you'll see a space here sometimes. You won't see a space here sometimes, as in the first part of the semester. Doesn't matter what you do, so long as you are self consistent and doing something reasonable. And so long as you don't do something like this, which some people sometimes do for God knows what reason. All right. <laughs> There is one wrong way to indent your curly braces.、Um, so now let's go ahead and do at auto release pool. And let's go ahead here. Whoops. And ns log. And then we'll tease apart what these things are. And then we'll actually fire up Xcode to see things more in situ. All right. So. That is exactly what we typed earlier,、uh, or what we had on the slide earlier. So let's tease apart these few parts. So at the very top, we do have something that's quite reminiscent of C. It's import, though, instead of include. And does anyone know or want to conjecture what the difference is between import and include? Yeah? Maybe import only takes the specific things that you call in your、uh, program. Ah,、uh, maybe it only takes the specific things that you call in your program. Not quite. It does actually take them all. But a good analogy here is PHP's require once. Function, which means that you can import the same file again and again and again in all of your various files, and you don't have to worry about doing it more than once. They're not, you're not going to get an error message from the compiler saying you already defined foo in two pla twice just because the same file is read. Because recall from CS50, what the preprocessor in the compiler does is it will open up the file called foundation.h, copy its contents, and effectively paste them into the top of your file as though you yourself pasted them there.、Um, For those more familiar with low level C code or something like CS61, it, it, this 
uh, include statement from years past will, it could be used to implement this same functionality, but you would have to do something like this, like define foundation, and then you would say if n def if not defined underscore foundation. So in short, there was this very hackish way with what are called macros or preprocessor directives in GCC and other compilers where you could teach the compiler that this file's been loaded before, and you teach the compiler such 